Okay, should be ready to go. Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 10.01. I will read the land acknowledgement. The city of Thorold is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Haudenosaunee, Rock, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anish Nebe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The city of Thorold stands up with all Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands in which we live. We'll move on to item number three here now, declaration of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Okay, seeing none, I'll move on to item four, adoption of the agenda. Can I get a mover and a seconder to adopt agenda? Okay, moved by Leslie and seconded by Mark. I'll call the question, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, that is carried. Item number five, adoption of the minutes, ECCBAC 2-2024, January 12, 2024. Uh, can I get a mover and a seconder to adopt the minutes? Okay. The mover? Okay, Councillor O'Hare. And uh, a seconder, please. Okay, Leslie. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and that is carried. Item number six now, we've got a couple presentations here. The first one is uh, about EV charging stations. So I would like to welcome Elaine Birkbeck from Flow. She's going to speak to us about EV charging stations in Thorold. And she's just welcome. coming in as a panelist right now, so she'll be up in a second. Okay. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning, Elaine. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, I assume based on uh, the screen here, can you see? Can you see me? No, we don't have you on video yet. We have a blank screen. Yeah. OK. Well, I can see all of you, which is interesting. <laughs> all right, so I just got a pop up for video. So that should be loading shortly. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And head nods, can everyone see the slide deck here? Yeah, we got you. Okay, perfect. Now I wish uh, the video was on, but um, you know, no worries about that. So yeah, today I wanted to discuss EV charging solutions for the city of Thorold. Appreciate you all taking the time. I'll try to keep this fairly short and high level. So Flow, if you have not heard of Flow EV charging, we are the number one leading EV charging network operator in Canada. We enable over 1.5 million charging events per month thanks to our vertically integrated solutions for EV chargers. We at Flow not only manufacture the charging hardware, we also run the network operations and we deploy the software, which I'll get into in further slides. To date, we've sold over 100,000 chargers, both across public and private institutions across North America. And to date, thanks to our Flow mobile app, we are enabling 450,000 plus drivers to enjoy reliable and seamless charging experiences every day. Another large differentiator is our network and our uptime. So currently with regards to charging uptime, that is essentially a measure of how often that charging station is online and operational. And we are leading the industry with an uptime of over 98%. As you can see from this map here, by partnering with a network operator for EV charging, 
you're able to essentially have the peace of mind that those chargers will be running 24 seven for you. And we enable this based on the fact that we have a network operations center in Quebec. We are a privately held Canadian owned and operated company. And through our Quebec head office, our network operations center monitors all of our chargers that have been deployed to ensure if there are any issues, we are effectively troubleshooting and deploying a service technician to get those chargers back up and running. As you can see from this slide here, we have public and private sector customers across all various different industries. Our products are very well suited and designed for government. And since inception in 2009, our CEO, Louis Tremblay, has had great relationships within uh, Canadian government. We also are working with the city of Toronto. We've deployed charging infrastructure for the city of Toronto, the city of Niagara Falls, and the city of St. Catharines. As a high level reminder, there are three different levels of charging stations that are available to you. The first is level one AC charging. So this is a charger that you typically find in a residential home application for any EV drivers that require charging at their home residence. Now, when we look at commercial and institutional chargers, both for commercial businesses and government, we find that level two and level three chargers are the best fit. So a level two EV charger will take an EV battery from 20 to 80% in as little as two to three hours. However, when we look at our level three, our DC fast charging, our level three chargers will power up and charge an EV battery in 30 to 40 minutes. Our latest innovation, Flow Ultra, which is our newest charger on the market launching this March, will power up an EV battery in 15 minutes. But I just wanted to pause and see here if anyone had any questions thus far. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Councillor O'Hare. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Elaine, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, how many uh, current uh, charging stations do you have in St. Catharines and Niagara Falls? I do have access to that data. I have a tool that enables me visibility on every charger in your region, whether they, those be flow chargers or non-flow chargers. So let me pull that data and I'll get back to the committee with the uh, updated number. You could also supply that later. I don't want to stop you from your presentation. I just thought, as you mentioned it, you might have those numbers available. So at a later time, it's fine. Definitely. Yeah, I'll pull a report for level twos and level threes and share that with you and the committee for sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving along, I will shift gears a little bit and talk to the federal rebate programs that are available to the city of Thorold. These programs were designed to accelerate the adoption and installation of EV chargers across Canada. The first program that I feel would be a really good option for the city is called Pollution Probe. This is a federal rebate program that's exclusive to Flow. So they've partnered with Flow exclusively and the target for Pollution Probe is municipalities in rural communities in Ontario, as well as fleets. And I understand from your team, you have fleet operations that may require EV chargers. This rebate program allows for up to $100,000 in funding. All of the EV chargers must be installed and operational by March 31st of next year. However, just note you are able to, we can ship the charger out prior to this date, but it does have to be installed before March 31st of next year. The application process is very easy and seamless. It's essentially a website, which I will send the details off to you on. And you submit some paperwork through the website. 
and the team at Pollution Probe will get back to you on the status of your application. Now, how it works is Pollution Probe essentially will provide you a rebate amount based on the level of charger you install. As you can see from this chart for level two chargers, there's a maximum reimbursement of $5,000. And as you get into those faster EV chargers, you're eligible to receive up to $75,000 off the total project costs. Now, what is meant by total project costs is that is the cost of not only the charging hardware, so the EV charger, but also the cost of installing that EV charger. So definitely a, a very lucrative, worthwhile program. We've had many applicants um, for year one thus far, and we're accepting applicants now for year two. Scout Environmental, this is a secondary federal rebate program that's available to the city of Thorold. I recommend that you apply to both of these programs and see which of these programs gets back to you fastest with your application and approves you. So Scout's also a federal rebate program. It's um, in partnership with Natural Resources Canada and also targeted for fleet uh, for specific municipalities. And you are eligible at the city this also, similar to Pollution Probe, allows for up to 50% off the total project costs. Maximum funding per project is $100,000, and those EV chargers need to be installed by March 1st of next year. So similar to Pollution Probe, it's an online application. Um, the team at Scout will get back to you within three days if your application has been received, and then 30 days to confirm acceptance into the program. And the reimbursement is in line with the Pollution Probe program as well. So before I pivot, also wanted to take a quick minute to pause there and see if the committee had any questions about the rebate programs. Okay, is there any questions that somebody might have for Elaine on that? <clears throat> okay, Mark. Uh, you're muted. Mark, you're muted. I think he's unmuted. It's just not hearing you, Mark, unfortunately. Okay. Maybe if someone else has a question, we can come back, Mark. Or... Anybody else have a uh, question? Is this working now? There we yeah. go. Oh, okay. Sorry, I have a new computer, new webcam and stuff. So I first time I'm using it. So I, sorry. So my question was, um, uh, the, you, you talked about two different um, rebate programs. Um, I'm assuming though that the city would only be able to utilize one of them, not both of them. You can't use them like overlapping, can you? That is correct. Because both of these rebate programs are federal, you will only be eligible to you know leverage one of those programs from the onset you can apply online to both however you'll you're only truthfully going to be able to receive the funding from one of the two it's up to you which one you opt to move forward with i will though have you note that we just finished this week our ontario rebate program so the Ontario government was incentivizing businesses and government, you know, city municipalities to install EV chargers through a, a program called Charge On. Because that program that just ended this week was provincial, there was the ability to double dip with a provincial program. You are eligible to stack it with a federal. But for these programs in particular, they're both federal for fleet. So you um, would be choosing one or the other. Okay, thanks. I just wanted that clarification. Okay, thank you. Perfect. So now to review some charging solutions. Core Plus, this is our number one best-selling level two charger. As you can see from the slide here, we have various different configurations. We have wall mount options, single pedestal options, which are perfect for a parking lot. We have dual pedestal options. 
And then as you look to the right of the slide here, you'll see options for a dual pedestal with cable management, which is a configuration I highly recommend. With regards to choosing the configuration, all of these chargers are designed with aluminum, they're durable, they're built for outdoor installation. So you don't have to worry about snow or rust or corrosion. And why you would select a core plus level two charger for the city, um, for any you know, fleet or buildings in particular would be this level two charger, if we take fleet for example, would allow your fleets to be charged while they're not in use during the day or at night while they're not in use. Because um, as you can recall from you know, the previous slide, this will charge up the car in two to three hours. I do, however, recommend some fast chargers as well for the city. The first two, the Smart DC, we've deployed for numerous different police departments across Ontario that are interested and have purchased and installed these units. Smart DC allows for those fleet vehicles and any public EV drivers to charge up in 30 to 40 minutes. It's available in two options, a 50 kilowatt and a 100 kilowatt. And then to the right here, we have our Flow Ultra, which is our latest charger. It's designed to charge an EV car in as little as 15 minutes. And it's also configurable. So as cars get faster and faster from an EV perspective, we're going to have the option for you to easily upgrade power modules to support faster charging. Just some quick highlights on Flow Ultra. We've designed it with the EV driver's experience in mind. So as you can see from the top there, we've installed and engineered this unit to have overhead lighting. A lot of EV drivers that we surveyed through our market research and users in general were having difficulty charging at night. So if you can think about the complexities and the user experience involved with charging EV cars, these overhead panels allow for a seamless, easy charge, whether that be at night, um, in the dark, and promotes visibility and safety. Also, this unit is ADA friendly, which is great. And moving along to warranty, all of our commercial chargers, whether those be level twos or level threes, any EV charger you install for Flow comes with a one year standard warranty included in the product cost. This warranty essentially includes the hardware. So the actual EV charger parts and any labor required in the first year. This is a screenshot of our owner's web portal. So you at the city would have access to logging in to this website. Essentially what it does is it allows you to monitor all your charging stations, configure them, if you wish to bill EV drivers, you can charge based on, let's say for example, you're installing this in a touristy area, you have the option of, of charging those EV drivers for each charge. So this is our portal. We do training on this as well and happy to partner with you to get you up and running. Global management services, these are included with the charger. As I mentioned, 24 seven driver support, 24 seven station monitoring. So if anything were to happen to that charger, we at Flow are able to troubleshoot remotely as well as deploy a service technician to get that charger back up and running. I mean, well, we rarely do have to do that truthfully because how our charger uptime is over 98% and based on how robust and reliable our network is. So quick summary, why flow? Um, I touched on a lot of this and here are just some good considerations for you and the committee to review when it comes to electrifying your fleets. Um, essentially, we would wanna understand the number of fleets, how they're being used, uh, the buildings in which those fleets are being parked and stored and how many hours per day they're in use and happy to put together a proposal for you with some high level budgetary estimates and options for you um, in terms of discussing next steps as well. And here's my contact. I will send these slides off to Justin to disseminate across the committee.
And just a note on that, they're already in the agenda, so they already have all the slides. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Elaine. That uh, that gives us some real food for thought. Um, I, I know the city is currently uh, updating their uh, strategic plan, and uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a CEP component in it. Um, this really um, gives some ideas to us. Uh, I'm sure the city is going to be looking down the road at electrifying their service vehicles. Thorold is a fast growing city right now, and I can see the opportunities for uh, uh, municipal parking lots to have a, a charger or two. I've seen a couple in some of the shopping malls around the Niagara Peninsula, and I have seen a, a flow set up at a Canadian Tire at the corner of Thorold Stone Road and uh, Montrose, is it, I believe? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is great. Uh, Councilor O'Hare, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a question to you, to uh, Ms. Burbeck. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, of course, uh, this time is coming, we know it. Um, so it's great that uh, you came to us and brought this information. I just have a couple of questions about costs, of course, and I know you can't uh, nail down specific prices, but if you could just give uh, us a ballpark to start thinking about uh, what we'd be looking at. You spoke about the uh, core plus level two, um, and the smart DC 50 kilowatts. And I'm just curious if you can give a ballpark figure of uh, the hard costs uh, of the equipment plus the installation. Where are we looking at approximately to have these installed? Yep, happy to do so. I'm gonna review and pull up that slide. So with regards to the core plus, and I'll talk MSRP retail pricing. Just note, typically with projects, the electrical contractor, you know, electrician that is installing these flow chargers would typically purchase through a local electrical distributor in your region. So when we look at a level two core plus wall mount, ballpark is those start at around 5,800 for a wall mount. Single pedestal is around 7,500. And when we look to the right on this slide at the dual pedestal with cable management, those are roughly 12 to 13,000 per charger. And that includes all the accessories, all the bells and whistles, but just factor in on top of that, there are installation costs when installing EV chargers, of course. Installation costs, we typically estimate and we recommend to our customers to budget approximately 80% of the cost of the charger you need to budget for the install. So, you know, let's say hypothetically, roughly you're installing the dual pedestal with cable management on the right here and that's 13, you could budget another 12 or 13 for the install. Okay. Thank you. And the Smart DC, how much is that one? The yep. So Smart DC 50 kilowatt, that one starts at 55,000. The Smart DC 100 kilowatt retail pricing is 75,000 and Flow Ultra is 230 and goes up from there. But just note that, you know, with regards to the rebate programs, you have the ability based on which charger you decide to install, you're getting between five grand for a level two core plus up to $75,000 back, mm -hmm. which is a really nice, um, yeah, nice from a financial perspective. Great, I really appreciate that, thank you. And one last quick question. It's uh, amazing to see uh, that you have so many flow charging stations in the Yukon. Um, how is that working out? Our flow chargers in Yukon are doing extremely well. We've had little to no downtime, meaning that charger's been uh, in use. And uh, also too, our chargers are certified to withstand really extreme conditions. 
from a temperature perspective, we have very robust exteriors for those chargers based on aluminum enclosures. And they're tested to withstand Canadian climate, which is great, um, which is another reason why we've really had a great number of years of being very successful in Canada is because we've designed this product for, you know, Canadian winters and, and climates. But um, yeah, let me coordinate with my counterpart who deployed and installed those chargers in the Yukon and I can get some, uh, some live stories and feedback, but uh, yeah, as of right now, they're doing extremely well and the community is very pleased because truthfully with the way, like you said, the industry is going, every community is going to need chargers right? Every workplace as well. Great. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Her. I see Mark has his hand up. Yeah, just um, sort of feeding off of um, Councilor Hare's questions uh, regarding pricing. Um, I'm wondering if Elaine can explain just briefly the, some of the difference between uh, the pricing for, say, a uh, residential home um, level two charger and the level two chargers that you're uh, talking about here. Yeah, so with regards to our Flow X5 and our Flow G5, those our, yeah, those residential chargers are AC powered and they're designed for residential based on the price point being, you know, 1,300 for those. Uh, they're sold online, so it's a different model from, you know, an installation standpoint as well. So all of the chargers I presented to you today are for government, institutional, and commercial projects. Um, I mean, if you do have residents at the city of Thorold that are interested in flow home chargers, we distribute those flow home chargers in a few ways. We have the ability for those EV drivers to buy them online, and we distribute those through electrical distributors in your region. So let's say we had an EV driver that needs a charger for residential use. They can order this through an electrical distributor and the lead time is two weeks. Um, a lot of our distributors actually stock them as well. So um, the lead time actually might be quicker. And that's a good segue, I mean, with regards to lead time, our, our core plus lead times are two weeks because we manufacture in Quebec and the smart DC lead times for the fast chargers are four weeks. It, in just a follow-up question, if I could, the um, management system for the level two chargers though, uh, that you're talking about for the city, uh, I'm assuming would have uh, additional capability than what a residential would uh, home owner home owner would require. Is that correct, or is it essentially the same unit? No, we've designed the core plus to be vandal proof. We have also designed it to accept payment. You at the city can opt to either charge for each charge, or let's say you're installing these for your fleet and, you know, charging, and by charging, I mean billing, billing those drivers mm -hmm. is not a requirement. We've designed the core plus to accept billing. So for example, let's say you had workplaces that are interested in this unit. There's two ways that an EV driver can pay and activate the charge. The first is all of the drivers are using our flow app on their, on their phones. And the flow app allows you, once you approach this charger, to firstly activate the charger and secondly to pay for the charge. Another way to pay for charging is through an RFID card. We find that's less popular, but that, that is an option. And as you would imagine, those residential chargers for our flow home residential chargers don't have the payment capabilities. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, any other questions from anybody? I don't see everybody on screen, so excuse me if, I, uh, if I'm missing you. 
Okay, I don't uh, see any further hands up. So I'm going to thank you very much, Elaine, for the presentation. This gives us a lot to think about. I'm certain that, um, you know, we're going to see support from this committee as the city moves forward with their uh, strategic plan and uh, whatever green energy options they're looking at into that, uh, that particular policy. So again, thank you very much. Thank you all. Hopefully next time we connect, uh, the video will be up and, and rolling. I hope everyone has a great weekend. And just a question for the committee. Are you aware who the best point of contact would be, you know, hypothetically to discuss this further? Uh, Justin, could you answer that? So I believe uh, through Jeff Holman's team and Abu that we've been you've been talking to. That's probably the best, unless Jeff has uh, anything else to advise. No, no, I think that's fine. Uh, Elaine, we can connect with you uh, um, and Abu can as well. He's the one that will be um, kind of managing this, these projects for us. But ultimately what will happen is uh, we'll get maybe some type of a recommendation or some direction from the committee that we'll bring to city council. And they may ask for a full report, which will kind of kickstart the process. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll definitely provide my contact to you both and, you know, any further questions, happy to address those, happy to provide a high level proposal uh, for you both to review as well. And uh, yeah, thanks again for your time and wishing everyone a great weekend ahead. Okay, thank you again. Um, if I could uh, question, uh, Jeff, you talked about uh, recommendation coming from this committee. So that would, is that something that we would do at this particular meeting? We would put forward um, a request or ask staff to look into um, getting more information on this particular initiative? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. The, uh... I think it's always helpful to have uh, some type of formal direction from the advisory committee uh, because then we can, in, in our reports to council, we can talk about, you know, what information you've received. And, um, and then that saves us having to go back to some type of uh, formal, you know, public process. Um, the other thing, too, that... Um, uh, I wanted to mention here was, um, I think it was the vice chair, um, Mark brought up the discussion about a, a strategic plan. Perhaps it was Councillor O'Hare. Uh, regardless, um, I think it, it's important to get this committee's feedback uh, when we go into the strategic plan process to talk about these greening initiatives and how important it is for us to either be on the receiving end of these types of uh, presentations or to be, you know, as resources permit, a little bit more proactive and, and go out and start reaching uh, and establishing these contacts, uh, contacts for you. Um, so that's an important part as well. So we'll be looking for one, some type of recommendation from this committee and then some type of uh, involvement in the strategic plan process that talks about how, uh, environmental initiatives are advanced um, to the committee table. Right. Okay, thanks. I get it. So when the strategic plan, I guess it's going to be a draft version that will be made available for um, the public or committees to review. And at that point, is that when we would be putting in uh, input? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the... Uh, the city staff has made arrangements and council has approved the engagement of the firm and they'll be starting the public process, uh, which will include reaching out to committees. Um, and I don't have the exact uh, schedule, but I, I'm, I'm certain that there is a, a, um, a point where we might, um, you might want to invite them to either the committee or have a separate session with them to make sure uh, your interests are um, covered in the document. Okay, great, great. Um, any questions on this uh, uh, from the committee as far as putting forward uh, a recommendation? Should we go ahead and... 
Yeah. Uh, Mark, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, just um, a, a comment to give a, some perspective on some of the things that we can be talking about, but we really need the input from the city in terms of what the scope is. Um, are we talking about simply the city fleet or are we talking about public uh, chargers? And then when you have discussions around public chargers, the, the challenging um, um, piece of that will be talking about um, rental housing, like apartment buildings and things like that, which is the current challenge across North America and the world in terms of getting uh, electric chargers uh, installed. So there's there's those perspectives that we can definitely um, uh, talk about. Okay, yeah, that can be brought up um, at, a, at the proper time for that. Uh, Leslie, you've got your hand up. Um, I think it would be great to move forward and just make a motion that we want council to look into this and staff. That at this point, that's all the information we have and all the ideas of what we would like to see in that report, we can address after that. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, Justin, um, have you got uh, some, uh, you know, some wording you could uh, cobble together for us? Uh, so, uh, Matthew can weigh in too, I guess, but uh, I would suggest maybe um, motion to direct staff to prepare a report on potential options for charging stations in the city of Thorold, and they can dig up some more research into this and get some more, we have some of the pricing, but get some of that uh, info put together. And then that report, uh, once it's done, could come back toward this committee and then, of course, to council uh, with some potential options. Okay. So let's move with that. Um, have you got something you can put up on the screen for us to possibly read? Is that a bit too much to ask right now? Uh, just give me a minute or two though for that. <laughs> Second. Just wanna make sure we're we understand what we're saying yes to. Well, the time's coming for something like this, and uh, you know we've got to we've got to be prepared for it. It's got to be, you know, in the plan for what we're going to do year over year. For the next couple of years as the population continues to grow and we're seeing more and more evs on the road now <clears throat> uh councillor longo you uh, yeah thank you chair um just a question through you to uh either um justin or matthew um obviously we know we need to go in this direction but does this committee have the authority to direct staff to prepare a report i'm not quite yeah. sure if we if we do you know we just we ask staff to prepare a motion uh, excuse a excuse me chair chair I'm just wondering, yes. Matthew could chime in on this. Yeah, I can take that, Mr. Chair. Um, that's correct. Uh, the committee can't directly direct staff. Uh, it would be putting a motion for this, but it's essentially recommending that council approve that motion. So this would right. go to the next council meeting that we can put it on, and then council can debate the request. Yeah, I know. I know it's just wording, but I wanted to make yeah. sure we were clear here. We we need to stay within our our boundary and scope here. Yes, I, I get it. Yes. Yeah. If if I could maybe make a little uh, a bit of a rec recommendation, um, it, it may be that we ask um, council to consider this as part of the strategic plan. Um, that that way we encompass a little bit more than just charging stations. We maybe need to let council know that. We need to have a vision for um, the way I look at this. What comes first, the charging station 
or the vehicle. You know, at this point, I don't believe, uh, maybe Jeff can fill in here. I think the only vehicle we have that's electric is a Zamboni at this point. I, I don't think we have any vehicles at this point. So I think we need to look at this as a, as a wholesome project here and maybe in our strategic plan, because it's a, it's a vision of the next four years, where we're going, first of all, with a fleet and where we're going with the ability to charge that fleet. And I know there's an aspect of public chargers out there too, but this can all be part of it. So I just wanted to throw that in there and see if any committee members have any comment on that. No, it's, it's good clarification. And I can see that the strategic plan would probably take each of those uh, components and identify what the, what the goals is. Like when you're talking about the service fleet for the city, uh, what are they looking at in transitioning from uh, internal combustion engine to EV uh, service trucks. So yeah, that's I which I would hope that's going to be in the strategic plan. Sure. Thanks. Uh, any other comments? Elaine uh, has something to weigh in. Okay, Elaine. Hi, I had a quick comment to make. We at Flow based on our legal team and our regulatory team do have access to a report that is updated by the government where I am happy to report back on the number of electric vehicles currently within your municipality. I do think that would be a good data point to leverage as we build that perhaps into the plan and discuss next steps. Okay, very good, that's a good, very good point. Uh, any other comments at all from the committee? Okay, seeing none, should we move forward with the uh, motion as as to what uh, Councillor Longo was indicating? So the wording I have, and I'm just having trouble getting it on the screen here, it's um, that council directs staff to prepare a report concerning EV charging options in the city of Thurl and include this in the city strategic plan development. Are you, is everybody okay with that wording? Uh, Councillor O'Hare. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I like the wording. I'm just wondering, uh, can we also put in uh, something that uh, suggests that it can, also come back to this committee so that if there are some suggestions before it goes uh, directly back to council that we can, as a committee, um, tweak it if it needs tweaking or um, just see what uh, the result is. Okay, good point. Everybody agree or is there any other comments? Okay. Back to you, Justin. Yep, so just going to put in and that options be uh, brought back to this committee. Okay, I think we're covered now. Is that agreed? Okay, can I get a mover to, uh, okay, Leslie moves, uh, seconder. Mark, I'll call the question now. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Seeing none, that's carried. Great, looking forward to seeing how this uh, initiative moves forward. Okay, going on to our next uh, presentation, Trees for All initiative. I'd like to welcome Jeff Holman, Director of Public Works and Community Services to present about the Trees for All initiative. You're on, Jeff. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I have to say that the presentation in front of you is not my presentation. It's actually a presentation that was uh, presented to staff by the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, particularly Emily Simons and uh, Jeff Fricade. And I see that Jeff's here. So it might, be, if you don't mind, I would ask him to kind of step us through it. And then I can maybe provide some comments from a staff perspective on how we might implement some of the recommendations. Okay. Okay, Jeff. Uh, Jeff or Todd, you're on. Great. Thanks for um, having us this morning. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this with you. Um, 
is somebody on your end going to uh, the sh share the screen with the presentation a little bit there, or do I have capabilities to do that from my side? Mm, there we go. Okay. okay. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. So just to give you an overview about uh, what Trees for All is, it's uh, uh, endeavoring to be a high volume, multi-year tree planting program uh, on both public and private lands in uh, urban and rural areas within the Niagara watershed. So uh, this partnership with the municipalities um, started up back in uh, 2021 with the first uh, request for information that the federal government had with respect to their 2 billion tree program uh, that came out. So the, the band got together back then, so to speak, and we've been making progress towards um, that high volume multi-year tree planting uh, program ob objective. So right now um, it is at the, the point where uh, we're, we're aspiring to plant 350,000 trees over the next five years in uh, the, the rural landscape. And uh, uh, yeah, this is um, to be done up with both private residents and on, and on public properties. Uh, the idea is to um, increase biodiversity, enhance uh, ecological co-benefits, uh, put trees in the ground from a climate change perspective. Um, and the authority has been doing this uh, for quite a while. We would quite often get solicited by municipalities to help with community plantings in urban environments with naturalization uh, because of our subject matter expertise. And we've had a long tenured uh, rural tree planting program. So it was the idea of mobilizing together towards these goals um, and to capitalize on the 2 billion uh, tree funding opportunities that came around. So next slide. Uh, so what we shared with staff was that um, as we are mobilizing towards this, uh, we've got subsidies from 2 billion trees right now with some aggregators on, on the rural side. We work with Forest Ontario and we've just had another stream made available to us um, by our umbrella organization, Conservation Ontario, partnering with Tree Canada to do bare root type rural plantings. Uh, this was communicated as some of our, uh, our process throughout the year in terms of how we go about planning uh, for those plantings. Uh, right now we're in the midst of looking at our scope for this year and uh, we've got um, allocations to confirm with our suppliers at the nurseries and uh, also um, uh, making sure that we uh, have turn back deadlines and stuff like that for the, uh, the, the funders to us. In April and June is when we typically do the site planting and the actual or site prep and the actual planting. Uh, September to October, we're into the survival assessments. Uh, October to November, we're doing um, the site visits for the next year. So this is a year over year kind of a process that we've kind of explained to the, the city that we do. And we've been doing this annually uh, for a long, a long time. We do the post plant reports in December uh, that are requirements back to the aggregators that, that we work with as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what we also wanted to communicate with the, with the town was um, as part of the 2 billion tree uh, initiative that the partnership with the municipalities was working towards, we were awarded uh, a capacity building grant under their capacity building stream back in, I believe it was 2022, but we, we completed most of the work uh, just prior to May in 2023. And it was to work in partnership to if you're going to plant a high volume of trees over multiple years, where are you going to do it? Your functional dependency is where you're going to, where you're going to plant them. So we uh, had a marketing campaign that we branded as Trees for All uh, to solicit uh, private landowner interest and to see who would be um, interested in planting on their properties. But we also worked with municipalities uh, to potentially exhaust planting opportunities on their public land. So a lot of them offered uh, public land planting available to us. Uh, whether that was providing us um, a, a complete inventory of their public lands and letting us kind of look for those opportunities or uh, giving us a sense of where they th they thought there might be some planting opportunity. Um, the world is in the former there. We got a good list of already uh, viable uh, opportunities provided to us by town staff, but uh, we wanted to communicate the result of uh, those that inventory. Sorry. Um, 
as the, the we wanted to communicate the results of that inventory work as a potential uh, opportunity for for tree planting in the municipality as a whole. So here's some of the preliminary numbers coming back on the public land side and uh, on the private land side in terms of what came through that process with the town. Uh, you can see there, and we'll explain a little bit in a minute about mm -hmm. the um, the differences between how we assess these things in terms of high, medium and low from a planting opportunity perspective. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, when it came to uh, public land, we were looking, and again, we're looking here mostly at that um, rural type uh, planting opportunity where we would be planting bare root trees. We also made applications to the federal government with the potted kind of urban style, but uh, what we're looking at here is more of the um, that rural bare root kind of opportunity. And there are, as you saw, some of town opportunities in, in that sense, but uh, a high meet, a high, uh, High priority site would be something that could hold more than 500 trees. And that's tied to some of our eligibility requirements with the uh, vendors and uh, things like planting method, which is uh, an efficiency consideration from our perspective is, uh, is a factor. Also site prep access and, uh, you know, total planting area. So it's, it's about opportunity to address uh, the planting site quickly is generally the theme that's coming over here and making sure we're eligible with the, the, the funders. Next slide. On the private land side, it's similar, although we looked at quantities a little bit different. We did have a lot of interest in the, uh, the private landowner side for people who are in, uh, you know, an agriculture, agricultural context, that rural context where they have up to three acres in some cases or more willing to plant. Obviously that's uh, some quick wins. We can do it efficiently with, machine plants and obviously things again, like on the public side, uh, you know, the degree to site prep that would be required to plant these things with a, a good survival perspective, were all factored into how we basically rationalized uh, the priorities that we assigned to all the opportunities that came across our desk. Next slide. So this is um, an overview of uh, some of the opportunities that uh, came across for Thorold. Um, these look like they are showing the private ones. And uh, obviously the outline there is a difference between how we kind of preliminary assessed how they could be planted, uh, a hand planting versus a, a blending plant, which would be a combination of hand and machine. And um, unfortunately, I don't know why. I think we intended to update this map for, for the town, but we'll certainly... Uh, do that uh, shortly because um, the the public properties aren't uh, listed on there and there's a number of those as well so um, if those were on here you'd see it would be uh, well distributed across the across the city sorry i think i've mentioned town a couple times next slide uh, so here's the the results from that uh, assessment on the uh, the public land side there was uh, one site um, that we kind of identified could hold up to uh, 400 type potted stock trees on the on the public land side when it comes to uh, the bare root sites. There were two in an urban context and eight in a rural with the, the tree sites that you see there. So again, appreciating right now we're trying to um, finalize scope for implementation with those rural bare root type plantings. That's why that area is highlighted in red there. So there does seem to be some opportunity there. Uh, next slide. And this is the same kind of idea on the private side, just to give you a sense of the opportunity that came through there. So we've got a couple of sites on the, on the potted side that are unquantified at the moment, just uh, by nature, we have to get back and uh, look at the opportunities there a little bit. We got a lot of um, interest from people in subdivisions at times who would be interested in a tree or two in their backyard, right? We did not just uh, limit uh, who we would take uh, people's interest from tree planting. So there is some of that in there. Um, and again, appreciating we're looking at working with those uh, subsidies um, through aggregators that focus more on the rural type planting. Um, we're more interested in what you see there on the bottom table in terms of how many bare root sites we have in a rural context in the town. So from a private perspective, there's five with about just over six and a half thousand trees. Next slide. 
so this is just some preliminary information that we shared with town staff, just to give a size of the uh, the total program across the watershed. And again, the watershed includes our partners in uh, Hamilton and Haldeman, where our watersheds begin. But the that 350,000 trees uh, in terms of cost to implement uh, with our preliminary budgeting uh, factors out to about 5,000 or 500, 5 million there. And then if you split that out over the implementation timeline, we get a sense of how much uh, we would need from municipalities to participate to, to address uh, that in an equal kind of context. And you can see there, we've got our aggregators, Tree Canada and Forest Ontario, factored in to, to get a little bit of a 40,000 foot view on how the cost sharing is, goes. Uh, you can see the MPCA is in kind there as well. And then of course, on those private land sites, as we have been working uh, ever since we've been due tree planting in a cost sharing sense, the landowners generally need to contribute at about a 25% rate. So uh, if you just look in 2024 there, it means the, the municipal ask is uh, just around half of that but when spread out across all the partners uh equally it would look uh, about that number there at thirty six thousand, which is about just shy of four percent or four cents on the dollar for the total um envelope there but we do know that the opportunities don't come from all municipalities and partners equally so that's what the second table is about there so you get a breakdown of those numbers that we provided you in terms of uh, the opportunities and total numbers of trees and uh, the specific cost to the city. And then there down at the bottom, uh, assuming there might be an even implementation pace, we've broken that out by year to look at annual kind of contributions. And again, I would caveat, this is uh, all preliminary to share with town staff to, to talk about um, and, and the opportunities to participate. Uh, we we tell everybody it is entirely flexible based on what you can uh, you're interested in or even what you can afford so it's more about a starting point to discuss your interest in the in the services and the opportunity that the partnership brings to address this and uh, uh, you know it's like I said it's flexible in terms of scaling up and down and once we do have a better sense of what an individual partner's scope is uh, that could change things uh, as well. So um, just to kind of sum up, this is again uh, to largely look at that rural kind of uh, bare root style plantings that the authority has done. Uh, we, When we submitted to 2 billion trees in two, 2023, we submitted in that stream, a rural stream. We also submitted in an urban stream, which is more that potted type stock uh, which does line up with more of the opportunities as you kind of saw in some of the stats coming through earlier on the municipal properties and parks and other areas where we could do naturalization and other enhancements with uh, a, a bigger type stock. Uh, that application, despite the fact that we were uh, told by the federal government we would get a decision on in December, is still under review. I've confirmed that that is under review and not a, a, a status boo-boo a in the system, so to speak. Uh, so that um, means to me that other half of uh, the tree planting opportunity with potted stock that leans more heavy on municipal lands, uh, we still are contending for potentially a higher subsidy from a direct two billion uh, tree award there. So um, even though these numbers focus on that rural side, and as you can see, there is some opportunity in some of the thorough sites, there is that whole other side that the partnership and trees for all represents as well too. Uh, we really appreciated the opportunity to discuss with city staff uh, these these kind of preliminary assessment information and, and associated costs on way to uh, hoping to partner down the road to plant trees in the city, both in both contexts on your on your public lands, and uh, to help support uh, the private residents who uh, express interest in planting on their properties too for for the benefits that the tree planting uh, does provide and the objectives behind the program, which is to build biodiversity resilience uh, and uh, address those ecological co-benefits that plantings have and all ultimately those climate change uh, mitigation benefits that planting trees provide as well. So thanks for listening to me ramble. Uh, I'm sticking around for questions, so.
Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jeff. That was a great presentation. I'm sure you're gonna get uh, <clears throat> quite a few questions. So let's open the floor for some questions here. I see Mark's got his hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the MPCA. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation and uh, definitely support uh, the concept of planting trees for uh, addressing uh, the many issues that we have with climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, a couple of uh, questions. Uh, the first one is on looking at the map, it, it appears as though the largest chunk of the tree planting would take place in the Short Hills Provincial Park. And I just want to make sure that I understand that correctly. Uh, and then the second question is uh, related to public lands. Like you said, unfortunately, it didn't show up on the map. Could you just give us one example of of, uh, of tree planting on a, on a public property, a proposed uh, tree planting on a, on a public property? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Through uh, through the chair as well, and perhaps um, Mr. Holman could comment on this as well too. We kind of actually did start this this year already. I think it was the the woodlawn summary. We did kind of a public uh, planting there. That was one of the sites that the town had identified, and we did discuss as staff that might be an opportunity to carry on with some efforts there. Once um, you know, should there be further planting opportunity identified with the other site plan and and uh, future plans for that property. Um, but it was one of, uh, I think we had up to 18 sites identified by staff. That's a ballpark number in my head that I seem to remember. It was a good amount relative to some of the other municipal partners that we're working with as well. Okay. Um, and then the, the the Short Hills thing, the, the map did classify those as uh, private land opportunities. So I'll go back and check that one because I do appreciate that does look uh, really close to the provincial park there. And um, just confirm that when we give you the updated map as well with the public properties on it, that that was in, one is indeed private, not a mapping well, area is, and in conflict. It is in the Boy Scouts Canada section within the park. So maybe mm -hmm. that's considered private. I, I don't. Yep. Could, could very well be. Okay. I see um, Jerry, you had your hand up. Uh, through you, Chair, that's all I was going to say is that it was probably because it's the Boy Scout camp that it's coming up as private, not part of the Short Hills Provincial Park. So Mark already said that. Okay, thank you. And um, Jeff Holman, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, we have uh, a number of different spots that we were looking at uh, that are publicly owned. And uh, we wanted to look at a tree planting program that uh, not only added to the biodiversity of, uh, and uh, the aesthetic of, this, of the city properties, but also to help us deal with some other issues that we've had with um, off-road vehicles and um, those type of uh, uh, misuse of the property. And if we could establish uh, some type of a, a green space there and formalize uh, some of the plantings, we can... Uh, accomplish a couple different things at the same time. Uh, it, it, the one that comes to my mind is in um, uh, Port Robinson uh, East, uh, south of our eco park, where there is some open space there um, that people like to drive ATVs and snowmobiles on that we could probably look at greening that space up a little bit. Um, and then a couple of other spots, uh, Melsport Park, um, and then and some locations in Confederation uh, Park as well. So um, it, yeah, that's still work in progress, um, but there's ample opportunity to um, for these types of things, uh, including building on the um, the work to, that we were able to do last summer in um, at Lakeview Cemetery. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Hare, you have your question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jeff, thanks very much for the uh, presentation. I always uh, uh, appreciate uh, getting as much information uh, from you as possible regarding tree plantings. Um, my question is, on your two charts right at the end of your presentation, uh, it says that there's a municipal subsidy of, let's say, approximately half a million dollars um, and when that's divided through the 15 municipalities, that's $36,000. And uh, 
Thorold's amount for 2024 is $44,000. So is this amount based on simply uh, divide the uh, municipal subsidy into these uh, various municipalities, or is it based on actual tree planting? That's the first question I have. Yeah, the first one was just to give a sense of the total uh, program kind of cost. And if it was to be equally spread out, that's what it would look like. Then the the, the next two are actually looking at the opportunity or the, the perceived opportunity based on these preliminary assessments that we shared with you in terms of tree numbers in the different contexts. And then uh, the uh, it, it's applied to that. So in some cases... Um, it's a little bit more based on having more opportunity. And in other places, it's a little bit less than uh, they have less opportunity. But like I said, I would um, I would encourage not to get um, too hung up on the numbers because again, it's a point of departure to have discussions about how we're proposing to go about breaking down costs and all that. And like we said, we're entirely scalable and uh, we've had this experience with other partners as well. Some of these preliminary assessments uh, we're running into um, unknown operational uh, considerations for a property where the actual opportunity is a lot less, right? So these numbers are going to be shifting quite a lot as the scopes get confirmed and what um, partners' interests in, in, in working on year over year actually is and those specific scopes uh, refine numbers. So it was a 40,000 foot kind of view at bringing the associated cost or potential cost to the specific opportunity to partners uh, for the first time. So my part uh, B to that yep. question is uh, we have, um, according to this chart, um, an ask from the NPCA of 44,000 uh, from the city of Thorold. Is, it, is that how I'm interpreting this? No, it, that's a that's a just. Hey, um, if we were to break down and all, all your opportunity stands up and those numbers hold, if we were to break it down uh, as even as possible over a five year implementation timeline, uh, that's how it would kind of look. Uh, that said, if you want to do less, uh, we can certainly do less. So that's that whole concept of uh, what you're prepared to support or what your interest in supporting uh, would equate to. Um, and if you, so if you want to, uh, front load and do more, I, I don't think a lot of people are thinking that way, but that's an opportunity as well too, right? If you're really excited and you want to do more, more aggressively, that stuff, uh, can be considered as well. That's the whole idea behind the flexibility. So it's a, it's a, it's an idea of what this looks like as a total, as a cost and, uh, preliminarily broken down as evenly as possible over the five years. Okay, but so, we don't we don't have to stick to it again it's flexible to what the interest and your affordability is so um one point i just want to make is that we just passed our uh, um, 2024 budget and uh, i don't believe this figure uh or any figure similar to this was in that now perhaps um uh jeff holman can comment on that and uh if that's correct, then this might be something that we're going to have to be taking a look at for next year. So, um, okay, go ahead, uh, Jeff Bowman, because I just see you had your hand up earlier. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's correct. So, we um, have been working on this for quite some time, waiting to hear about avail availability of funding. So, we haven't really had these numbers, at least when we got them. Uh, the draft budget had already been distributed. So you're right, uh, Councillor O'Hara, we haven't uh, included this. Um, however, uh, as, as Jeff Ricade has explained, there's some flexibility here. So um, at the moment, we have, I think, in our uh, reserve around $5,000. Um, and uh, we're also planning to, uh, if we're successful with our Tree Canada uh, grant, um, have another ten thousand dollars that we um, that we can use to um, include in our planting program for this year. We also last October awarded a contract to Gold Nurseries, and our plan is over the course of this year to plant somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred and thirty five trees uh, on uh, residential subdivisions, uh, one tree per lot, and uh, and two trees on the flankage. 
uh, we have those funds um, in um, set aside in reserves already. Um, so my advice, if you're looking for a sun direction here, is to look at um, pushing some of the program, or at least using that that um, that chart to confirm some type of commitment to the Trees for All program. It just may be that we do more in the latter years than at the beginning. Uh, and this will give me an opportunity to put these numbers into the capital forecast and um, make sure that they have a position um, in the capital in the draft capital budget for 2025. At the, in, in the past, we've been trying to implement our tree planting program, one grant application or one subdivision agreement at a time. And um, we haven't really been able to make a firm commitment to something like this. And the Trees for All program gives us some targets. And I think it will be helpful to council uh, determine how much funding should be allocated, not just every once in a while, but every year. Uh, towards a continual process to greening our community. Okay, thanks. Thank you, <clears throat> Jeff. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Jeff Bricotti. He's got his uh, hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we're aware that um, these numbers kind of came out at not the greatest time after a lot of municipal budgeting processes have been complete. Uh, it was like uh, Mr. Holman referenced, um, this is a, a pivot, a model uh, away from a direct 2 billion tree application on the rural side that did not advance, which would have uh, offered a subsidy of 50% of eligible costs. So they wanted us to work with where they've already invested with these other aggregators, with Forest Ontario, with Tree Canada, through our, our the partnership with our, our umbrella organization, Conservation Ontario, and those that subsidy rate is a lot different. So we, we had to pivot those numbers and um, got to communicating to the partners in the municipalities uh, late later than that but um yeah like i mentioned it's in, it's 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 flexible from that perspective moving forward okay thanks jeff any other uh, questions or comments okay seeing none so i i guess what uh, jeff Holman is saying is that this is another uh, motion that we would be uh, putting forward for council to direct staff to um look at the long term uh, plans for this uh, Trees for All initiative. Am I correct? Have you got uh, something that you could uh, cobble together, Justin, for what we're going to be putting forward to council? Yeah, so if you could repeat, we're you're looking for council to direct staff to... I guess look into the long-term uh, planning of this Trees for All initiatives and, and uh, I guess but what Jeff says is applying, um, looking at the expenditures that we're looking going forward for the five-year proposal. Interesting. I suppose it could be included in this, I'm not sure, in the strategic plan again as well. It would be nice to see it in the strategic plan. Can you see it? Uh, yeah. Is there anything anybody has to uh, add to this? Are we missing anything? Um, Jeff, forgot, do you, you still got your hand up. Did you have something that you wanted to say? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I forgot to mention too, when it comes to those numbers, it's, um, it's an evolving model. So we continually look for funding and to bring, uh, the cost down as well. So it's, um, as we bring on other funding sources, it goes into the cost sharing there, um, that's relevant. We just landed uh, some money yesterday that would be altering the cost sharing model as well, too. It would be put towards it. So that's going to be an evolving space. Again, it's a multi-year thing. Things change from year to year. So the, the authority is mindful of that and always looking to 
enhance the cost sharing aspect of it. And the last thing is, um, again, we are still contending for 50% uh, on the dollar direct funds from 2 billion trees because that urban application, we don't have a decision yet. And like I said, we were expecting one in December. Uh, confirmed that's not a boo-boo so i'm looking at that in a in a positive sense and that will help with some of that potted urban type opportunities as well we're also aware that if that is eventually unsuccessful um there is a pivot for that as well too because there is a massive partnership between the federation of canadian municipalities announced with tree canada that essentially replaces that urban direct tree planting stream with 2 billion trees. Um, so there's uh, a lot of uh, unknowns yet and opportunity still out there to figure out how to bring um, money to all of this opportunity, which we're fortunate enough to have identified and plan uh, towards ahead of time. So uh, again, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. So I, I would assume then that um, staff is already gonna be, they're gonna have a comprehensive report available um, Jeff Holman, you were in discussions with with Jeff Ricard, and you got some preliminaries. So, are we are we being presented with more information right now than you had uh, uh, before? No, I think it, uh, through Mr. Chair, the uh, it's important that I we get the feedback from this committee. Uh, we'll bring a report at some point uh, in the future that talks about um, our tree planting program and, and what do the Trees for All um, means in terms of uh, capital investment uh, at some point in the future. Um, I just, uh, you know, maybe this is not the right time to talk about this, uh, Mr. Chair, but um, one of the things that this committee was was working on was uh, an Earth Day event. Yes. Um, and um, was there an opportunity through Trees for All to may, maybe help with some of the um, tree giveaway initiatives that you had been talking about? I think, uh, yeah, that's a good question because I, I uh, carry... Um, did you indicate some kind of uh, MPCA participation for the Earth Day event regarding the tree giveaway, or am I putting you on the spot? Uh, through you, Chair, I, I did indicate that there was potential for support from the NPCA through our community stewardship program, which is in some ways separate from the Trees for All program, but they, you know, we're all on the same team. Um, so, but there is potential for us to support the tree giveaway um, in a few different ways. Like one is helping with plant species selection, which we've done for other municipalities like the city of Port Coburn. Um, but there may also be available um, support for helping with the cost of trees as well, depending on um, our budgets and things like that for this year. So I did indicate that to you um, in our chat about the, the Earth Day event. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so moving forward, um... <clears throat> How, how do we proceed uh, with that with as being related to the Earth Day event, Jeff? Um, maybe it's not related. Uh, um, and, and it may be your preference to keep them separate. Okay. Um, was Hester, okay. Let, yeah, well, let's move on because uh, there is an Earth Day working group update coming on uh, the agenda a little later so we can talk about that at that particular point. Uh, we've got a motion uh, that uh, Justin had put on the screen that uh, we can put that to a vote if there's, uh, if the discussion is uh, pretty well closed on this. So, Justin, can you put that back on the screen, please? Yeah, one second. And we need a mover and a seconder as well, if we're yeah, good with okay. the wording on this. Yep. So uh, can I have a mover for this uh, motion? Okay, Councillor Longo, can I get a seconder? And that is Leslie. Uh, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Okay, that's carried. Great. This is something that's going to be... Uh, well worth looking into in the very future. 
uh, we're moving forward pretty good now. Um, okay, and then thank you, uh, Jeff Todd, for your presentation. And uh, let's move on to uh, correspondence. Uh, item 7.1, the reconsideration uh, environment, climate change and biodiversity advisory committee's meeting schedule. We had a motion on this that uh, went to um, council. This was a reconsideration vote, uh, uh, January 16th meeting, meaning it was a vote that was to be taken to open the original report, CLK 11-2023, that uh, council approved on November 21st, 2023, that uh, changed our meeting schedule from 12 to six annual. Um, this particular motion needed a two thirds uh, favor, favorable vote to open the report for discussion. Unfortunately, we didn't meet that threshold. Um, Justin, can I ask you to announce your vote, how it went with uh, how each councillor voted on this? Is that appropriate? So since it was not a recorded vote, I don't really have uh, who voted on it there. But if any committee members, it is on the website, the video. So if you want to look and get a sense of it there. But since it wasn't recorded, we don't. Uh, really okay. Have okay. There was three votes uh, against and, and five in favor. So uh, our our motion was uh, shut down. There was no opportunity for any discussion on that. So the, the uh, report's um, recommendation stands as it, as it goes. Uh, Leslie, you have your hand up. You're muted. Sorry, I thought it was unmuted. Um, we met with the um, the mayor and Tim and various other people and staff, and we went over exactly what the terminology meant to the committees that were identified in that report. I can tell you that we came away completely satisfied that everything was working the way it should. Um, we are not going to proceed. We uh, understand the process now. Um, and um, so as far as we're concerned, and we were the other committee that was um, upset about it. Um, everything has been explained to us and we're in agreement with it now. Okay. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions on, on that? Uh, seeing that, what I'm going to do is later on in the agenda, I can talk about uh, um, our, our meeting schedule and how it's going to work. Uh, going down the road, which I think we'll, we'll be okay with. Um, next, um, for correspondence 7.2, Partners of Climate Protection Program. The city has submitted their application to the Partners of Climate Protection Program. Uh, who is speaking on this? I uh, can. Uh, so, so just the background of what this was is um, council had approved that uh, the city joined this uh, group back in February of last year. But it appeared that it wasn't uh, actioned on. It wasn't followed through with staff changes and so forth. So I have submitted our application formally to them. However, that was two weeks ago, and I still haven't heard from them. I followed up yesterday and still haven't heard. So hopefully we get back to them. And uh, they send us, supposed to send us resources and so forth to include us in it. We have one staff person that is the contact for it. And then Councillor O'Hare was selected by council back in February to be uh, the council representative as well. Okay, uh, thanks for pointing out the uh, the meeting uh, that it was held in February because I went online <laughs> and I was I was going through. Uh, yeah, it was the, a while ago. <laughs> I, I knew there was presentation and uh, yeah. I just couldn't find it. So now I I, I want to go back and, and pay attention to it and see what it's all about. Yeah, so uh, hopefully we hear from them and uh, that moves forward. <laughs> Okay, any uh, comments or questions on that? Uh, Councillor O'Hare, or, or, uh, Mark, you got your hand up? 
Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so first of all, that's that's great news. So I'm glad uh, that that application has been put in. That puts a lot of discipline and, and process. And uh, as Justin said, there'll be resources uh, that can be used to, uh, to uh, guide the path, so to speak. I also believe that this is going to, again, uh, sort of fold under the uh, strategic plan. Um, my question is, uh, perhaps uh, Councillor O'Hare could answer it, is that the scope of this, again, is not just looking at the city's greenhouse gas emissions, but is also looking at all of Thorold, including um, pro um, residents and, and businesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Mark. Um, Mark, it's going to be focused on uh, City Hall, but there, of course, will be other tie-ins. Um, it's uh, uh, a program that is quite new. We haven't received uh, any information on it so far. We just had the presentation from one of our staff members back in February. Um, and uh, it, just to summarize very quickly, um, there's no cost to the city in this. Um, what it is, it's a, a group that are just trying to encourage uh, positive changes in uh, making our city uh, more environmentally um, uh, uh, satisfactory. And in many different ways, whether it be through uh, HVAC or vehicles or lighting, all these things will come under their guidance and guidelines that they will be presenting to us. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from them. And uh, of course, it would be a really great uh, resource for the city. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions on this? Okay, then seeing none, let's move on to uh, committee business, um, 8.1. Sorry. Uh Mr. Chair, I I forgot. I have one more correspondent. Actually, I came in late. Okay. Um, just uh, information that uh, committee recruitment is going to be opening back up uh, to fill vacancies for committees for the month of February. You can apply, and just that this committee is looking for one at-large uh, member. So if you know anyone, you can uh, direct them to the website to uh, apply. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that news bulletin because I was yep. going to raise that in roundtable discussion. <laughs> yes, uh, but, uh, yes, I thought it'd be better hope, here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I do hope we do get somebody applying. In fact, maybe a couple of people who want to apply and we can take them all in. The more the better. Uh, yeah, okay. And then moving forward to uh, committee business uh, 8.1 Walker Industries proposed South Landfill expansion. Oh, we were trying to have this on last month's meeting, um, but unfortunately, um, our meeting was cut short, so we had to defer some of the items. So this was uh, Vice Chair Mark Freeman, who attended the uh, open house for this back uh, December, I believe, Mark. So I'm going to pass this over to you just to give us a little update on what was discussed at this open house. Yes, thanks, um, Mr. Chair. So um, I'm not going to be able to provide an all-encompassing summary of, of uh of the Walker Industries uh, open house that was held on December 14th, uh, but I'll I'll do my best to uh, to tell you what I learned on that uh, on that night. Um, many of you on this committee probably already know a lot of this. Uh, first thing I'll mention is that uh, like a lot of these types of events, the company reps um, outnumbered the public about four to one, uh, which seems to be common with these types of things. Um, and I'll also start by saying that. Um, garbage, unrecyclable garbage, we know has to go somewhere. Um, and, you know, we could have some separate discussions on focusing on reducing waste. But uh, uh, I'll also say that what Walker is doing in turning that uh, methane into energy um, is better than just allowing it to leak or be flared. Um, however, the ideal use of biogas uh, is really for specific requirements where renewables can't be used, and that's not necessarily the case here, as I'm going to explain. The uh, first question I had for the uh, Walker's representatives there was, where is the garbage coming from, and, uh, and, and what does it consist of? And they tell me that it's a mix of residential, commercial, and even industrial waste. They claim that it is non-hazardous and that it is coming from all over Ontario. 
this, uh, from my understanding, expands the the um, sort of the scope of what Walkers does there. Um, they uh, right now or the phase one of their landfill was really um, satisfying the needs of the Niagara region. But at this point, it's not about satisfying Niagara region's waste problems. It's really about growing Walker's business. Uh, so I'll just mention that. Um, they also talked about um, how they receive the waste. They don't really do any, any further sorting. Um, what they get just gets landfilled. And it could potentially contain all sorts of uh, dangerous chemicals and plastics and metals and a variety of other chemicals. Um, I understand from a reliable source that uh, the waste that they are receiving also includes fly ash from Durham, Durham region's waste to energy incinerators, which is a nice way of saying they're burning garbage to make electricity. Um, fly ash typically contains heavy metals uh, like mercury, arsenic, copper, and chromium, and other things. That said, Durham Region and the government of Ontario, of Ontario has certified that this is considered non-hazardous. Unfortunately, I heard about this after I went to the session, so I, I didn't have a chance to uh, talk to anybody from Walkers about this. Um, in terms of the, uh, the biogas that Walker is producing, uh, some of it is converted by Walker into electricity on site, and they use it for their own consumption. And they also sell some of that electricity to Hydro One that's added to the uh, to the Ontario grid. Um, as you all know, uh, a lot of the biogas that Walker is producing is fed to GM, uh, the near nearby GM plant. And again, they burn it to to generate electricity. And um, it's general electricity use, so it's not really being used for a special, a special application where renewables uh, or anything other than fossil fuels could be used, unfortunately. Um, the new news there is that with their expansion, um, at the end of last year, Walker was starting to feed biogas into the Enbridge fossil gas network. And this allows Enbridge to... Uh, charge willing customers an additional two dollars a month uh, to try to green their their gas although the reality is it's it's such a small percentage of of the uh, of uh, the Enbridge network that it's not going to make a difference. One of my main concerns was around the um, leaching uh, from the landfill uh, whenever it rains or snows and the snow melts uh, contaminated water uh, typically gets out of the out of the landfill into the surrounding areas, but Walker spent a lot of time uh, showing that their landfill is 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 protected, especially lined to prevent water from escaping their property. And they say that they do capture that water that is in their in their um, in their landfill, and they do partially treat it before sending it to the city uh, for um, as as regular wastewater. Um, and I had forgotten one thing that Leslie had mentioned uh, several meetings ago that it would increase truck traffic in the area. I, I didn't get to that with them as well. So I'm not sure how much that is increased. And um, as we had talked about uh, several meetings ago um, and walkers confirmed that this landfill expansion that they're doing does not require municipal approval. It just requires provincial environmental assessment approval, which they have. So that's about it. Okay, thanks, Mark. That's pretty comprehensive uh, for uh, missing a few points. <laughs> uh, Leslie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, and the first thing is that if they told you that um, they just started receiving uh, or were planning to receive garbage from all over the province, uh, back in 1984, um, they part of their proposal was to start accepting Toronto's garbage. So since 1984, we have been accepting Toronto's garbage mm. at Walker yeah. Brothers. So it may be that their consultants don't know the history as well in answering a question like that. I don't know. But yeah, I believe uh, to clarify what they said was is that their existing phase one landfill was mostly Niagara yeah. uh, waste, but now they're really opening it up is is really what they're saying. 
And that was part of the EA hearing back in 1984. We were aware that it was going to continue and this expansion was going to come. What I'd like to see is, I realize that they only have to get the province to agree, but they must have had to do some report because one of the biggest problems with the quarry as a hazardous waste site, which is why we opposed it, was that it's a shale quarry. So anything that leaches through and salt in um, is the chemical that causes um, material to be able to get through into the groundwater. That was the biggest concern. I don't think that that ever has been addressed. And if you're going to add substantially more over a longer period, um, I'd like to see that. I really would like to see whatever report they had to do for the province before giving, you know, I mean, I, I know they're going to go ahead with this, but it would be nice to have that uh, just in case there's a problem in, in, the, in the future. That's what we thought would happen now anyway. Uh, but we expected the municipality would be given a report that explained that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Any other comments or uh, questions on uh, March report? I think Connor has a question. Okay. Yeah, I see his hand up. Connor, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to let the committee know that uh, the city did receive the notice of commencement for this study. Um, so we are on the mailing list um, for the study and we will be receiving all the reports as well. So if the, uh, once we get the report, we can also forward it to the committee. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, any other comments at all? Okay, seeing none, let's go on to uh, 8.2 Earth Day Working Group update. I think what um, this meeting's going on uh, quite long right now. So uh, what I'm going to suggest is um, uh, I arranged to set up a meeting with Jeff Holman possibly next week. Uh, Leslie, would you like to participate in that as your uh, a working group member and and uh, I can see what Jeff's come up with. He was having some informal discussions uh, where we can look at for a venue. I can update with a, a number of people that I've reached out to that um, I'm looking at for consideration. Uh, you know, we can really start to get, um, you know, dipped into this. Are you, you available next week at all, Jeff, for a meeting? Yes, for sure. I would suggest later in the week. Okay. Uh, we have reached out to the City of St. Catharines, Mr. Chair, and yeah. um, they uh, are anxious to talk to us about what our plans are to see if there's some synergy there. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I, maybe Thursday. What is it? I think uh, we're going to probably raise this. Um, might be trying to plan a, a meeting for this committee uh, for, um, I guess that would be the ninth. There's a, a dog park environmental impact study report, and it was too much to add to this meeting. So we might call a special meeting for that. I'll get I'll get to that during the roundtable discussion. Where's your time? Okay. Do you want to set a time, uh, Jeff? Um, one o'clock or 11 o'clock works best for me. <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> uh, let's go for the one o'clock. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I figured <laughs> I'm beginning to understand yeah, how you work. Okay, that's great. Okay, then um, let's go on to 8.3. This is um, ECC BAC uh, C 1 2024. This is um, our meeting schedule. This is what has been confirmed by 
the council vote that we were going to move forward with um, meeting every other month. Uh, so council has voted against this. So that schedule basically stands. But in our, um, and this has been confirmed uh, through the, the clerk and he actually indicated it at the meeting when um, it was being discussed at council. Uh, our terms of reference under meetings allows me to call special meetings. Uh, so what I'm looking at, we, we are always going to have a heavy agenda moving forward. We won't really, we will not have an opportunity to skip a meeting. However, having said that, there may be a time during the year, uh, in the summer, especially when there's vacations uh, with people, we may not hold a July or an August meeting because we will have a difficult time trying to achieve a quorum. Um, I know this past January, where we are at the first Friday of the month, we didn't have a quorum. Obviously, some people, uh, you know, were probably still on holidays, but that's an anomaly there. But going forward, I would suggest to the committee members here that uh, keep in mind in your day timer, the months in between the months that are listed here, there's a good possibility that I'll be calling a meeting and we will continue to move forward meeting on a monthly basis. We do have the schedule to work with and I'll do the best to make sure that uh, if I'm calling a meeting, we're gonna have um, uh, items on the agenda that are gonna be worthy of discussing. Is there any, um, any discussion on that? Mm -hmm. Leslie? No, yeah, well, um, just rem remind me. <laughs> yeah, okay. When the meetings uh, take place, that's all I need. Yeah, so I'll, you know, there's going to be plenty of notice. Uh, I, I, I could just say that nothing's really going to change, but I can't say that. But um, no, I do have the right in our, our uh, terms of reference. So as long as we, we behave, uh, you know, we won't have that right taken away. <laughs> uh, Mark's got his hand up. Yeah, just a question, uh, Joe, in terms of, um, and I, we, we had sort of exchanged notes on this uh, at the end of last year. Um, at some point, we should get together and talk about what really our proactive objectives are for the committee. Um, obviously, the strategic plan is going to be a huge thing for all of us, um, but we should sort of try to get ahead of that as much as we can um with some some ideas that we could feed into that into that process once we understand the dates of the strategic plan development better but uh, we could start off by having a, uh, a a discussion on what is our objectives for for this committee yeah it could, it's i'm glad you raised that mark because uh actually this meeting i was hoping that that's exactly what we would would be doing but um Justin reached out and he had these two presentations to do and there's a third one coming and it was just going to be way too much to have on our plate for this um, meeting. So come March 1st, um, that's going to be one of the items that's going to be first and foremost on our agenda. So I just want to let people know that, you know, make sure when you come to the meeting that you've got the ideas that we can put into our long-term plan. And, um, and, and like Mark says, we can, we can get uh, some things organized and, and take, take into consideration that the strategic plan is being worked on and we wanna make sure that we're, you know, we've got a voice and we're heard when it comes to that particular issue. Uh, thanks again, Mark. Um, now I gotta get a mover. Oh, is there any further discussion on, on this particular memorandum in front of us? Okay, seeing that I still gotta get a mover and a secondary to adopt the 2024 meeting schedule. Uh, you've heard my explanation. We, we can't turn this down again now because we can't go back to council. It's already been defeated. <laughs> <laughs> so can I get a mover for this, please? Okay, Leslie moves, uh, a seconder. Oh, yeah, and a seconder, please. Okay, Mark is seconder. I'll call a question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Okay, that is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get into some round table discussion here. Um, let's uh, start with uh, Councillor O'Hare. You're up at the top of the screen for me. You got something. Uh, nothing more to add, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Leslie, have you got anything for roundtable? Uh, just I hope everyone will come out to Thorold's first CD Saturday on February 10th. 
Uh, we have lined up a number of speakers, um, vendors. Uh, it should be interesting, and we plan on continuing year after year if this is successful. So please, anyone that knows any vendors that would like to participate, please let us know. Otherwise, I hope to see some of you there. Yeah, good, great. I'm looking forward to it. I'm participating as a vendor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah looking forward to it. Uh, okay, um, Mark, have you got anything to add? No, thank you, Joe. Okay, um, let me go to uh, Councillor Longo. Have you got anything to talk? No, nothing, Chair, thank you. Okay, I've got uh, some people that are off screen right now. Um, Amber, have you got anything that you want to uh, comment on? No, thank you very much. Okay, how about uh, Carrie? Uh, thank you, Chair. I did want to uh, say to Leslie that uh, the NPCA would be happy to send uh, some native seed butterfly packets along for your event. We couldn't attend because we're already at another CD Saturday in Grimsby that day, but um, happy to send those along if you'd like to share them with uh, with folks attending. That so would just, be great. Yeah, I'll just get an address for you and, and I'll just send them over to you. Um, okay. And the other thing I wanted to share was that the um, the NPCA is going to be partnering again with the Niagara region, the city of St. Catharines, Ontario Power Generation to um, put on the Niagara Children's Water Festival again this year, which will be happening at the end of April, um, early May. So I believe the dates are April 30th to May 3rd. And if anybody on the committee is interested in volunteering and helping to present one of the activities to this, the kids, um, the topics range um, any anything to do with water. So there's some that have to do with like water distribution and there's some for climate change and things like that. So if you're interested, uh, reach out to me and I can let you know what um, what activities are available if you're if you'd like to come out and participate in that event. Okay, thank you. Um, and for me, I'm just going to uh, remind the committee that um, uh, Justin reached out to me uh, previously about uh, uh, a report for the uh, off-leash dog park on uh, Hebridams Road. It's an environmental impact study. And uh, we'd like to call a meeting for, uh, I believe it's going to be February 9th. Just giving the committee a heads up on this. Hopefully uh, we can get a, uh, a quorum for that particular meeting and, and get this um, environmental impact study talked about and, uh, and move forward. Well, so that's it for uh, my um, round table. Hi, uh, Justin, if you got anything that you wanted to add? Uh, no, just the February 9th uh, meeting, if both, at least a quorum's worth is available. Uh, the only topic will be the dog park is what we'll go over. Okay, so everybody's got notice of that. Great, thank you. Uh, our next meeting is going to be held on March the 20th, at March 1st. And uh, for adjournment, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned at 1149. And thank you everybody very much for all the great conversation.